So Dragonfly DB is a drop-in replacement of Redis that offers 25 times the throughput. Given that it is a multi-threaded implementation, it has a very different and interesting way of implementing transactions. This is the second video of the series and let's start with a very quick overview of Dragonfly. In Dragonfly, you do not have a single global hash table that all the threads access. They've adopted a shared nothing architecture, which means that your data is split across N mutually exclusive hash tables. And when the transaction comes in, that is affecting multiple keys belonging to different hash tables, that becomes a little bit complex on how the transaction needs to be handled. Now, first thing first, what do we need from transactions? From transactions, we need two things, atomicity and serializability. Basically, when I'm firing two commands in a transaction, let's say put k1v1 dash and put k2v2 dash, let's say both are owned by different shards. What we need to do is we need to ensure that all these, both of these changes are done atomically, which means either both of them are done or none of them are done. Now, how does this happen? So when a client initiates a transaction, this on the Dragonfly server, it will be handled by a particular IO fiber, right? That is dealing with this connection. Now, this fiber, this fiber becomes the coordinator. Right? Now, this coordinator is the one who will take care of the entire transaction lifecycle from beginning to end. Now, let's see what happens at each step. Now, here, the two keys that are involved are K1 and K2. Both are owned by different shards. The because Dragonfly DB has adopted a shared nothing architecture, you cannot have an IO thread that goes ahead and accesses these two hash tables directly. What it needs to do is, it needs to adopt the message passing paradigm. In very simple analogous way to look at it is, think of Go channels as a way to do this message passing between Go routines. Very similar to that happens over here. Now here, the coordinator is not allowed to access the data directly. So which is where the entire thing is done by passing message across the threads, adopting a message bus pattern. Now Dragonfly DB leverages two-phase commit to perform the transaction. You would have heard of two-phase commit in the context of distributed systems. I already have a bunch of videos on that, on how it is actually implemented with code. But this is where it's not happening across multiple machines, but across multiple threads in the same machine because there is one-to-one -one correspondence between them. So let's see what the two phases are. Now the two phases of Dragonfly DB transactions are schedule and execution. The whole idea is very simple. First of all, the coordinator, the coordinator fiber will initiate the schedule call with all the involved shards. For example, for a particular transaction, my keys involved are K1 and K2, which are owned by shard, shard1 and shard2. You may have 50 other shards there, but the shards which are involved, the first thing that your coordinator fiber would do is initiate a schedule with all the details with the corresponding shards involved as part of that transaction. Right? And then it will be waiting for the acknowledgement to receive from both of them. Right? Now, once that happens, one thing to note here is that while this is happening, only the coordinator fiber is blocked. Every other fiber is still working. Other fibers which are dealing with other IO with other IOs and other client connections, they're continuously working. They don't have to be blocked. Neither the shard threads needs to be blocked. The only fiber that is blocked is the coordinator fiber on which the transaction has begun. So that's why your throughput is never compromised. Right? That's the best part of it. Now, what happens in the schedule phase? Your coordinator sends to each shard the keys involved in the transaction that, hey, I want to schedule this transition, schedule this transaction and it waits for the acknowledgement to come in. Now, what does a shard thread do when it receives a schedule call? When it receives the schedule call, so when a shard thread receives a schedule call, what it does is each shard thread maintains a transaction queue. Now, this transaction queue has whenever someone is sending, whenever a coordinator thread is sending a transaction, it says, hey, I want to affect this key and this key. You own this key, please schedule a transaction. Now, when your shard thread gets it, it would put that transaction in a transaction queue. Now, obviously, when it puts a transaction in a transaction queue, it needs to know which transaction is it. So, which is where every transaction is given a simple integer identification, a simple atomic integer identification for that transaction 1, transaction 9, transaction 11, transaction 17, something on those lines. Right? Now, when each shard 
gets a transaction it adds it to the transaction the local the transaction queue is not global it's local to a particular shard and it is ordered by sequence number right now when it receives the transaction what happens is there is a scheduling algorithm that runs basically it needs to arrange the transaction in an order which maintains serializability right a classic property that almost every database needs to offer that the global ordering of transaction is maintained over there right? now this is where it would try to rearrange the transaction such that it does not lead to any conflicts and the arrangement may be different than the order of the transactions for example it's possible it's completely possible that a particular transaction came first then another transaction came but the ordering would have changed because of your scheduling algorithm this is where your scheduling algorithm kicks in now when a transaction comes to a shard and your scheduling algorithm cannot arrange it in a way that maintains serializability it fails the transaction the coordinator removes the transaction from the queue and it retries from the first step again right now when your transaction thread receives it what it does is it maintains a something called as an intent lock which basically says that how many transactions in the transaction queue are waiting for that key or are they are not blocked nothing is locked over here it just maintains that how many transactions are interested in modifying that specific key right please make sure like please understand the scheduling phase is not equal to exclusivity over here it just means that hey i'm interested in modifying this particular key right it is actually possible that if one transaction has completed the schedule phase your other transaction can actually mute the key there is no one which is stopping it from happening because scheduling does not mean exclusivity there is no exclusive lock that is taken on that key and the whole idea is it is possible for other transactions request to come in because that other transaction has also completed the schedule but not completed the execution phase right which means that schedule is not equal to exclusivity they're just showing the intent that hey i want to modify this key and please enqueue my transaction in your queue and arrange it in a way that maintains serializability that's all it does right now what happens in the execution phase this is where things starts to become interesting now when a coordinator it sends once your coordinator receives acknowledgement for its schedule phase from all the coordinator from all the shard threads what it does is it sends execution messages execution message in send like execute this first command execute the second command it sends this messages to the corresponding shards your coordinator starts sending the message when every when the message is received by a particular shard thread what it does it it executes it but here's the catch this is a transaction queue what it does is it always executes the command or the transaction that is at the head of the queue if it receives the execution statement from some other transaction which is not at the head of the queue it will be blocked for some time until it receives the execution from the transaction which is at the head of the queue it will execute that so the order of execution is maintained which guarantees serializability right and there is a small block because anyway the execution message will come from that other transaction which is at the head of the queue so if it receives an execution message from let's say transaction 9 it will have to wait for some time until this is taken away and that's how it works now this is where your entire execution phase is complete and in the last execution message your coordinator sends exec plus fin fin is finish exec plus fin message at that time any log that were taken on that key are released and it removes the transition from the transition queue marking it as complete and now this is where this is how your entire transaction works in case of dragonfly db you see how beautifully this is structured and you can see a one to one correspondence between the transactions in dragonfly db and a two phase commit that we typically observe in distributed systems right because independent set of threads with shared the thing architecture mimics our distributed systems and this is a really beautiful implementation imagine all of this happening in a single machine Right. and it's very beautiful very easy to uh, at least build a prototype out of it i would highly 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 recommend you to do so 
This was the second video in the series. The next two videos on the series will be about internal implementation of two of its very interesting data structures and you will have a great time going through the details. Right. So yeah, this is all what I wanted to cover in this one. I hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it amusing. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for that.